So, hello, captains of Armband. Welcome to another episode of Short Corners, where we interview footballers, managers, coaches, analysts, scouts, and even the owners of various football clubs to bring the different aspects of the game closer to you. And so, if you are a football enthusiast just like me and love to learn from football personalities, make sure to subscribe to our channel. And today, along with us, we have Mr. Joseph Gombau, the former head coach of Odisha FC, and someone who we all in the Indian football fraternity respect and love. So, sir, how have you been? Hi, thank you for the invitation to to be part of your program. I'm excited to be here. The pleasure is ours to just host you in our show. It's a brilliant opportunity for all of us to learn so many things. And I won't take any of your time and we'll go straight to the talking points. So, sir, your coaching career has taken you to various countries, including Australia, Spain, India, and even Hong Kong. So, how have your diverse experiences influenced your coaching style and approach? I think it is something very special that uh, happened in, in my life that uh, I am lucky. Uh, I like the football since I was a child, uh, first playing and after coaching. Uh, and uh, the life and the football bring me the opportunity to, to travel around the world and to, to work in a different places. I worked in Spain, I worked in Dubai, Hong Kong, Australia, in India, in US. And uh, I think that this is something uh, very special. No? that you can work with uh, different people, to know a lot of people around the world, and also to, to understand the culture of these countries and, and try to help uh, to grow the football there. And uh, I, am, I am so happy and uh, grateful to the life for, for this opportunity that, that bring to me in, in this current that, that I am having. Managing in three continents is a totally different challenge and you, sir, have aced it. So, sir, in... One of the previous podcasts, you talked about playing without feeling the pressure as the pressures often result in mistakes from the players. And one such example is the last season of Oresa FC. They came back from behind to gain 13 points throughout the campaign. How do you go about creating a stress-free competitive and also at the same time a stressless condition and team environment? We try from, from myself and from my coaching staff to take all the pressing the pressure on the players and uh, we we try to to make the day enjoy playing and, and, and of course uh, the, the score is important but always thinking in, in that uh, way to bring 120 percent in every single game and uh, we know very well what we need to do on the field and after that we'll see like this uh, as you say we come back a, a lot of games from behind which uh, which was something very <laughs> very important for us but then we achieved something that that we, we put as a target you know, that to try to be in the in the playoff and with a very young squad we we lead the playoff that uh, it was something very good. during your time at adelaide united you implemented a six versus six training drill with six rules to improve the team's passing and also the ball retentions so, what were the aspects you took into consideration while designing the session plans at Odisha FC? Then, how did you implement these? It is a, as a coach, uh, you always need to have your own, say, philosophy, methodology, the way that you believe that the team need to play, and the way that you work during the week uh, to achieve after in the game your concepts. No? Uh, of course, there are many ways to play football, different, and all the ways are, are good. It's not saying that possession-based football is better than, say, transition football, contra-attack football. No? Uh, we have, or I have, my own vision, the way that I want that my team to play. And from this, uh, during the years, uh, we create like our own way to, to work this, this kind of football. And we create like these uh, six rules that you say that helps a lot uh, the players to understand what what we want, and during the the week uh, we work a lot, especially in the precision. Uh, we work a lot these these rules that uh, we play a lot of small side games or, or games, and uh, we put these rules uh, to ensure that that this uh, became something natural for the players. That after when they are playing in the big game, they always try to to follow these these rules, and and uh, yeah, and I think that uh, it worked. And uh, it's something that I, I bring with me in every single club, in every single place that I go. Uh, it's my own philosophy. I think as a coach, uh, for me, there are one tip that you know, you always need to have is that uh, you need to believe in what you are doing 
doesn't matter the result you have worked at clubs such as fc barcelona espanyol as a youth coach so having been involved in youth development not only player development what do you think are the key aspects that are needed to be improved in indian football to nurture young talents and create a sustainable pipeline of players because we are seeing a stagnated pools of players just getting transferred from one club to another so what are some of the key aspects or key steps that indian football needs to take in order to nurture young talents i think it is coming uh, this take time because uh, a player that start to play in a youth system takes 8 10 years to for in develop and, and grow and, and become a professional footballer but there are something that is very important and uh, this is something that uh, india as a country need to to improve and is the youth competition system uh, uh, it's very important the training session for the kid, but also are very important the game that this kid play. The youth system, the second team of any club in ISL, the client competition that they play, they are together for a month or two more, and they play uh, this competition and they play maybe eight, ten games, which is not, you know, of course that there are clubs that because geographically uh, these kids can be playing in other leagues, uh, they cut easy, easy development, it's not the same uh, team in Kolkata, that there are uh, local leagues uh, that are team in Odisha, that uh, you don't have uh, this kind of competition. Uh, I think every day there are more uh, coaches, every day there are more uh, uh, people that is ready to, to, to show how to do the things to the kids in India, uh, but and what we are missing at this point is, is the competition. Uh, the competition needs to be stronger, more more open, more game. I think that this is something that, uh, because if you think India have a huge potential, many population, and uh, the good thing is that the Indian people, the Indian players, uh, they are uh, people that they want to work, they want to learn, they are so humble, they want to, you know, uh, just work. The problem is that even the Indian Super League every year is, is improving, but before it was three months, four months, uh, even the professional players, they stay for three months or four months with no competition. Exactly the same with the kids, but even even worse. And, and I think that this is something that the country is slowly, slowly need to, need to improve. I will just add another point to this question, that to develop good players, you need good coaches, and especially coaches who are from the localities, who are from the region from that state but as, as we have seen that you have actively exercised your ambition to develop the South Australian grassroots where you were in Australia and you hosted free seminars for local coaches and all those things which were heavily praised and still talked about until now so what is the importance of coach education especially in a country like India where we have seen in the central part of the India that is the whole central belt there is no coach development so, if a player comes from a state like Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh and all the central regions where football is not much developed, they have to train under coaches from South India, especially like Chennai or from Kolkata, which is a very football, is the football hub of India, Kolkata, then from Bengaluru. So, the language barrier keeps a, keeps a very big barrier between a player development, a player to develop and player to learn. So, sir, what is the importance of coach development in a country like India? And what are the steps that we need to take to develop good coaches all over the country so that we ha so that we can break this language man yeah, it's very important i think it's, it's a key point uh, to grow the football the level of the football in, in a country first you need to to have good coaches good local coaches and uh, you need to develop them and how, how you can do this uh, with a lot of seminars, with a lot of coaching clinics, with a lot of, say, uh, coaches courses, federation you need to, to implement in every single place of India. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it's very important. I was last season involved in, in the pro license of the Indian coaches. I make a, a speech there. Uh, they invite me. It was in Odisha. And uh, there are a lot of people that, that really likes the game. A lot of people that really love, have passion for football. But uh, as, as you know, India is a big country and uh, more people need to be involved and, and for sure. Uh, these, these people that have the passion and the love, they need to, to receive these tips, this, this, this kind of uh, 
uh, advisors to how to work with the kid, especially with the kid. And uh, yeah, I did this in in Australia because I I, I like a lot. Uh, I I did uh, this this coach sports uh, for free because I like it and, and and we we enjoy it and, and, and yeah, I think and the people appreciate it. And always I, I open to to help people that that want to learn and uh, open to to bring my knowledge and my experience to other people. Question that I personally wanted to ask because it's the favorite part of the show that is the tactics. So tactically speaking, what are some of the key principles that you emphasize in your coaching philosophy, and how do you implement them with your teams? No, I think as I tell you, you need to have your own way to play. And uh, in my teams, uh, I try that we have the ball, we have the position of the ball. I am a coach that that I like to to have the position on the ball. And, uh, and after that, uh, attack. This is uh, say the, the 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 two the two principles. Yeah? Uh, as as a coach, uh, you need to have very clear what you need to do when you have the ball, and uh, what you need to do when you don't have the ball. So, uh, when we attack, uh, I I like to do the little dart from the back, uh, and from there we we work depending on the opposition team how to break uh, them in this uh, in this uh, say uh, building up to arrive to the midfield lines with the position of the ball and after that depending every team how they defend how to break them uh, to to be successful uh, i like to play with open wingers uh, always uh, as as you see with like uh, are with jerry with nanda with isaac uh, with uh, uh, aniket uh, and uh, and after that, uh, important things is uh, what you do when, when you don't have the ball. And, uh, we like to press uh, as, as soon as we as we lose the ball. We normally press in, in the opposition field. And of course, if we are not successful after that, uh, we need, we recover positions and, and we sit back in a, in a, in a shape uh, to try to, to recover the ball. No? Uh, today, football... I think it's very important uh, two things that you need to to be aware and you need to, to work a lot is the transitions, what happens when you lose the ball uh, and what happens when you recover the ball. 70-80% uh, of the ball, of the goals in the study uh, of football came from transition and set pieces. And uh, now it's, it's a moment to work about these things. Right? How do you manage the pressure of making quick and accurate decisions from the sideline? Because from us who watches in TV, it's look like the coach is very animated. He's saying something, he's trying to convey something. And we think, are the players even listening? How are they listening? They are so far on the pitch. So, sir, what are the things that happen in the sidelines? And what is the pressure of making such quick and accurate decisions on the pitch that can just turn around the game on its head? It's a question that we all, the fans, me, everyone want to ask. No, I think, uh, first of all, uh, you need to prepare very well the games in the training session, thinking very well what, what, uh, which is the game that you uh, think that will happen. And uh, 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 when I prepare a game, I think it will this, it will happen this, it will happen this. But, but of course, it's a game. And, uh, sometimes what you, what you think is what's happening, and uh, there are a lot of external things that uh, you can be with 10 men, you can have an injury. And you can go see the goal early, and, and this change a lot of things, you know, your plans. And it's a moment to take decisions, it's a moment to, to try to arrange. The thing is, as a coach, you need to be brave. But also, there are a lot of things that come from, from the feeling that you have in that moment. You know, now is the moment to do this, and, and you do. It's difficult for the fans to understand the decisions of the coaches because they previously don't know the week. They don't know if a player maybe is a very good player, but that week. He was sick, just training Friday and Saturday, and then we play on Sunday. Or well, maybe uh, I don't know. The, the night before, he he don't sleep for for something. You know, there are many things uh, that, that, uh, that the fans and uh, sometimes the media miss. Now I will lighten up, move a bit because next question is a bit off topic, but it's a very interesting one. During your time in Australia, you were given the nickname of the Running Man. And even under all the videos I have watched in the last few days as well, whenever the Australian football and your video comes in the comment section, there is comment spam like the running man. And 
and they love the celebrations that you do on the pitch. But beyond all the celebrations and tactical decisions, how does a head coach's presence on the sidelines impact the emotional state of the players? Because we often see a coach getting a red card and though the team was playing very well and 11 players on the pitch, suddenly the team's performance tanks. So, what is the importance of a coach's presence on the sidelines and how does that play in the psyche of the players playing in the eleven? And there is, is what I tell you, the, the coach, uh, if you work during the week with the players, you have a plan, you explain to them what is what you think that is going to happen in the game. You try to help them when they have problems, tactically problems in the field, where you take more maturity, you become maybe more, more quiet. Uh, but uh, yeah, but there is, is this, is the passion that you have for the game, where, because you know how work are working the players, uh, you know how difficult it is to achieve something that, that you want to achieve. To achieve, uh, what you say, the, the coach decides to have an impact uh, with the players. If they are you beat, if, if, they, if, uh, if they work closer, of course the players uh, appreciate the work of the coach. But then, it's, it's, if you work uh, hard with them, if you have them, players uh, take you in consideration, and the team became a family. And also, in regarding to this, I have a quote, as you said, the coach. Coach, I, I have seen people telling me who plays that the coach, the head coach is like a guardian to them on the pitch. And one such example is when you were the coach of Kitchi and still people remember you. And also there is a statement where the Kitchi captain, Chu UK, applauded your contribution to the team. And he said that the coach understands that the players might be smaller than those in the other teams, but he using the ball more on the ground and gives us the advantage over our opponents. And he always took care of us and he showed us how to do the things on the pitch and his influence has helped us to gain much higher performances as well. So, it's also another example that how much important is it to have a great relation and how important is it for a coach and how is it important for the players to depend on the coach. So, sir, it's another example of how the coach needs to be on the pitch and how he decides everything that happens and also in that he is the one who is leading the team in fact on the pitch, sir. In your experience, what are the specific responsibilities does a head coach need to fulfill throughout the season? This That cannot be effectively delegated to the assistant coach or the support staff. Certain things that the coach only have to decide and that which makes the head coach so unique. So, what are certain responsibilities do you think that make the head coach totally different from the whole coaching staff? Keeping in mind the coaching staff is very, very important to the team. I think every coach works different. Uh, every person is different. Uh, myself, as a coach, I like to to make that everybody that is in the coaching staff has his own responsibility. Because uh, a person, when you have a responsibility, uh, you perform better. And you also uh, feel that, that the job that you are doing every day is very useful. You know, uh, I like that uh, my assistant coach has his own uh, responsibilities. For example, last year with Jacobo in Odisha, he took a lot of responsibility, all, uh, which is defensive staff, uh, defensive pieces. The goalkeeper coach has his own responsibility with the goalkeepers. Uh, the physical coach uh, has his own responsibility. Uh, the assistant, the Indian assistant coach, he was before because of his own responsibility. And, uh, everybody works very, very well. And as a coach, I think that there are things that you need to you need to do and you cannot delegate. Uh, for me, it's the communication, the communication with the player. Uh, when you need to to talk to the players uh, something that they need to do, or when you need to talk a player that will play a game for a certain reason, for tactics, for that. or when you need to you need to take the responsibility as the main coach that you are, have this conversation with, with the player. And after that, for me, I like to work as a team with all the coaching staff, knowing that I am the head coach and the final word and the final decision always comes from me. You feel that you need to do a change in the game. Sometimes even you don't ask uh, coaching staff because it's a decision that you feel that you need to do it. And, and you need to but uh, I like to work as a team, but never uh, delegating these, say, important conversations with the players, taking my responsibility as a head coach. You have worked with tons of coaches throughout your life, both in all the levels. So, what advice would you give to the aspiring football coaches all over the world? 
First of all, uh, that they have passion for what they are doing. I think that uh, without passion, it's difficult to work. Second thing uh, for me is that every single coach needs to have uh, his say own philosophy uh, and believe with this and uh, work uh, applying this philosophy uh, and uh, not changing the things for the results or because uh, the press and these things. And uh, also that, uh, today, uh, uh, football is uh, always in a constant uh, growing. And as a coach, you need to be open to, to learn every day, uh, to, to grow as a person, to grow as a coach, uh, to implement new things. Technology now is there. Uh, and, and you need to be smart and you need to be aware to to work with, with all these tools that uh, are coming in, inside uh, the the industry of football that before uh, wasn't there. You know, when I started to coach Taiki Chi in 2010, uh, it was a lot of things that now I am using that in that moment uh, it wasn't there. Well, but now you need to adapt yourself to this, uh, say, new new world of uh, all the data, all the, all the media, all the image, all the video, all the things that uh, are here. And you need to use. So, captains? That was all for today. We need to end our session here. Thanks, Mr. Joseph Gumbau, for being with us today. And to all of our viewers, thanks a lot for tuning in and make sure to subscribe to our channel for more such informative and as well as a podcast where you will learn so much about the footballing personality. So until then, it's goodbye from Armband. So Tata, we will see you in the next podcast.